It was 1987, and I was in my early 30s, living in a small town nestled at the edge of the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina. My name's Tom, Tom Harding, and I was a forest ranger by trade. Not the kind of job that made you rich, but it was one that allowed me to breathe, think, and more often than not, just be. It was the kind of job that made you feel alive, especially when you were miles deep in the woods, far away from the clamor of the town, and the only sounds were the rustling of leaves and the calls of distant animals. It had been a mild autumn, the trees shedding their last fiery leaves in a lazy dance to the ground. My routine patrols through the forest had been peaceful, almost too peaceful for my liking. I'd been on edge for weeks, a nagging feeling that something was amiss, though I couldn't quite place it. There had been whispers in town, the usual superstitious nonsense, about something stalking the woods, a beast of some kind. I didn't pay much attention to it. People were always looking for something to fear, especially as Halloween approached. It was late October when I first encountered the signs that something was wrong. I was on a routine hike through one of the more remote trails, a place rarely visited by hikers because of its rough terrain. The air was crisp, and the smell of pine needles filled my lungs. I felt at home here, the trees my only company, the earth firm beneath my boots. But then I noticed it, a silence that was unnatural. The birds had stopped singing, and the usual background hum of insects was conspicuously absent. As I moved deeper into the forest, the first sign of trouble emerged, a deer carcass, or what was left of it. It was mauled beyond recognition, its flesh torn apart, as if by something with immense strength. I'd seen bears take down deer before, but this was different. The bite marks were irregular, almost as if whatever had done this wasn't killing for food, but for sport. I felt a chill run down my spine, and for the first time in years, I felt uneasy in my forest. Something primal, some instinct buried deep within, was screaming at me to leave, to get the hell out of there. But I pushed the feeling down. I had a job to do, and the last thing I needed was to let my imagination get the best of me. I continued on, keeping my eyes and ears open, but the unease stayed with me. It was as if the trees themselves were holding their breath, waiting. By the time I returned to my cabin that evening, I was shaken. I tried to convince myself it was just a bear, or maybe a pack of wolves. But deep down, I knew I was lying to myself. A few days later, I got a call from the local sheriff, Pete Bowen. He was an old friend, a man I trusted, and he rarely called unless it was something important. Tom, we've got a situation, he said, his voice unusually tense. A couple of hikers have gone missing. They were last seen heading into the forest near your patrol area. Missing hikers weren't all that uncommon. People underestimated the wilderness all the time, wandering off trail and getting lost. But something about Pete's tone told me this wasn't just a routine search and rescue. I'll be there in an hour, I replied, already grabbing my gear. When I arrived at the search site, a small team of deputies and volunteers was already combing through the area. Pete briefed me quickly. The missing hikers, a young couple from out of town, had last been seen three days ago. Their car was still parked at the trailhead, untouched. But there had been no sign of them since. Tom, Pete said quietly, pulling me aside. We found something. He led me to a small clearing, where the ground was disturbed. There were drag marks, leading deeper into the forest, and a small patch of blood-soaked earth. The blood was fresh. We think it might be from one of them, Pete said grimly. Whatever did this wasn't human. I didn't need to ask what he meant. The tracks were all wrong, too large and too deep to be a man's. I could see the fear in Pete's eyes, something I hadn't seen in all the years I'd known him. The search went on through the night, the forest alive with the beams of flashlights and the murmur of worried voices. But as dawn approached, the unease grew. The forest felt more alive, as if it were watching us. And then we found them, or rather, what was left of them. The bodies were unrecognizable, mutilated beyond comprehension. 
Their clothes were shredded, and their faces were twisted in a final expression of terror. But it wasn't just the state of the bodies that haunted me. It was the fact that they were found in the exact same spot where I'd seen the mauled deer just days earlier. Pete and I exchanged a look, and I knew we were both thinking the same thing. This wasn't the work of a bear or wolves. This was something else. Something that shouldn't exist in these woods. The official report would later blame the deaths on a rogue bear, a freak occurrence, nothing more. But we both knew that wasn't the truth. We buried the truth with the bodies, for fear of causing panic. But the forest knew, and so did I. The following weeks were a blur. I went through the motions, doing my job, but the fear never left me. I found myself avoiding the deeper parts of the forest, sticking to the well-traveled trails. But I knew it was only a matter of time before whatever was out there made its move again. And it did, two weeks later. I was on another patrol, this time near a small, isolated village that bordered the forest. The village had a reputation for being... odd. The people there were friendly enough, but they kept to themselves, and there were rumors. Old stories passed down from generation to generation about creatures that lived in the woods, things that came out at night. I never paid much attention to those stories, until that night. It was just after midnight when I heard the first howl. It wasn't a wolf, that much I knew. The sound was deeper, more resonant, almost human. It sent a shiver through me, the kind you feel when you're being watched. I turned off my flashlight and stood still, listening. The howl came again, closer this time. I could hear movement in the trees, something large crashing through the underbrush. I should have left then. Should have run back to my cabin and locked the door. But I didn't. Something compelled me to stay, to see what was out there. And then I saw it. It stepped out of the shadows, its form silhouetted against the moonlight. At first I thought it was a man, but as it moved closer, I realized how wrong I was. It was tall, impossibly tall, and covered in thick matted fur. Its eyes glowed with an unnatural light, and its teeth, God, those teeth were bared in a snarl that sent a wave of primal fear through me. It wasn't a man, and it wasn't a wolf. It was something in between, something that shouldn't exist. But it was real, standing less than twenty feet away from me, and it was watching me. For a moment, neither of us moved. We just stared at each other, and in that moment, I knew I was going to die. There was no way I could outrun it, no way I could fight it. I was alone, deep in the forest, with no one to hear me scream. But then something strange happened. The creature sniffed the air, its eyes narrowing as it studied me. And then, without warning, it turned and bolted back into the woods, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. I stood there, frozen, for what felt like an eternity. My heart was pounding in my chest, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I couldn't believe I was still alive. When I finally gathered the courage to move, I ran. I ran as fast as I could, not stopping until I reached the safety of my cabin. I locked the door behind me and collapsed onto the floor, my body shaking uncontrollably. I didn't sleep that night. I just sat there, staring at the door, waiting for the creature to return. But it never did. By morning, I had convinced myself it was a hallucination, a trick of the light, maybe even a bad dream. But deep down, I knew the truth. The creature was real, and it was still out there, somewhere in the forest, waiting. I didn't tell anyone about what I saw. Who would believe me? The official story was already written. Bear attack, nothing more. But I knew better. And I wasn't the only one. The village elders knew. I could see it in their eyes when I returned to the village a few days later. They didn't say anything, didn't ask any questions. They just watched me with that same knowing look, as if they'd seen it too, or at least knew of its existence. Life went on, as it always does. 
The search for the hikers was officially called off, their deaths ruled as a tragic accident. The forest returned to its usual quiet, the events of that autumn fading into memory. But I couldn't forget. Every time I stepped into the forest, I felt its presence, lurking just out of sight. I stopped going on deep patrols, sticking to the outskirts where I knew it wouldn't follow. But even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was watching me, waiting for the right moment to strike. The years passed, and I eventually retired from the job. I moved away from the town, away from the forest, trying to leave it all behind. But the nightmares followed me, the memories of that night refusing to fade. I tried to tell myself it was all in my head, that the stress of the job had finally gotten to me. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't convince myself that it wasn't real. Because deep down, I knew it was. And I knew that someday, someone else would encounter it, just as I had. Maybe they'd survive. Maybe they wouldn't. But one thing was certain. The forest would always hold its secrets, and some of those secrets were better left undiscovered. I never went back to those woods, never set foot in them again. But the fear stayed with me, a constant companion. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, somewhere, waiting for the next unlucky soul to wander too deep into its domain. So if you're ever in the Appalachian Mountains, hiking through those ancient forests, remember this. There are things in this world that defy explanation, things that shouldn't exist but do. And if you hear a howl in the night, something that sounds almost human but not quite, do yourself a favor. Run. Run as fast as you can. And don't look back. Because if you do, you might just see what I saw. And trust me, you don't want to see it. You don't want to know the truth. Because once you do, there's no going back. When I first heard about the new trail at the outskirts of the Olympic National Forest, I didn't think much of it. I'd been working as a forest ranger for nearly two decades by then, and new trails opened up all the time. The allure of untouched wilderness, though, always brought in crowds, and it was my job to ensure their safety while preserving the delicate ecosystem. So, when they told me I'd be patrolling the new loop for the first few weeks, I didn't think twice. I loved the forest, and a few extra shifts weren't going to be a burden. The trail was tucked away, a good hour's drive from the nearest small town, Humptilips. Humptilips wasn't much, just a handful of stores and a diner, but it had a certain charm, a place where everyone knew everyone else's business, but they'd still welcome you with a warm cup of coffee if you were passing through, the kind of place where you'd expect nothing unusual to happen. It was late September a time when the forest seemed to hold its breath before the arrival of the Pacific Northwest winter. The leaves had started to turn, painting the dense woods in hues of orange, red, and gold. I always felt like the forest was at its most beautiful during this brief window. The air was crisp, carrying with it the faint scent of pine and wet earth, and the skies were usually a dull gray, threatening rain, but never quite delivering. I started my patrol at dawn, the trailhead was empty, which wasn't surprising considering the remote location and the early hour. The path itself was still fresh, the dirt packed down but not yet worn, and the markers were newly painted, their bright colors standing out against the dark trees. The forest was quiet, save for the occasional call of a distant bird or the rustling of a small animal in the underbrush. It was peaceful in a way that only the wilderness can be. I was about five miles in when I first noticed it, there was something off about the atmosphere, a tension in the air that I couldn't quite place. At first, I chalked it up to the isolation. After all, it wasn't often that I was this deep into the woods alone. But as I continued on, the feeling grew stronger. It was like the forest was watching me, the trees closing in just a bit too tight, the shadows stretching out longer than they should. I kept walking, my senses on high alert, I'd been in the woods long enough to trust my instincts, and they were screaming at me that something wasn't right. I glanced around, 
looking for any signs of movement, but the forest was still, too still. Even the birds had gone silent. It was then that I noticed the smell, faint at first, but growing stronger with each step. It was a rancid, almost metallic scent, like something had died and been left to rot. I slowed my pace, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. I'd dealt with my fair share of dead animals in the woods, cougars, bears, even the occasional deer that had fallen prey to the elements or a predator. But this was different. There was a wrongness to it that I couldn't shake. I followed the smell, my hand instinctively resting on the grip of my flashlight, though the daylight was still strong enough to see by. The trail led me to a small clearing, the ground littered with fallen leaves and broken branches. At the far edge, near the base of a large pine, I saw it. A large, dark shape slumped against the tree. I approached cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest. As I got closer, I realized it was an elk. Or what was left of one. The body had been torn open, its insides scattered across the ground in a gruesome display. The flesh was ragged, as if it had been ripped apart by something with claws or teeth far larger than any predator I'd ever encountered. Even more disturbing was the state of the elk's head. It had been twisted almost completely around, the eyes staring lifelessly back at me, wide and filled with terror. I've seen death in the woods more times than I care to count, but this, this was different. There was no way a cougar or bear could have done this. It was too violent, too calculated. I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever had killed this elk had done so not out of hunger, but out of pure malice. I stepped back, swallowing the bile that had risen in my throat. I needed to report this. Whatever was out here wasn't something I could handle on my own. I reached for my radio, but before I could bring it to my mouth, I heard a sound that sent a chill down my spine. It was a low, rumbling growl, emanating from somewhere deep within the forest. A sound that was too guttural, too unnatural to belong to any animal I knew of. I froze, my breath catching in my throat. The growl echoed through the trees, growing louder, closer. My instincts screamed at me to run, but my legs wouldn't obey. I stood there, rooted to the spot, my heart hammering in my chest as the growl turned into a roar. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, the sound stopped. The forest fell silent once more, but the tension remained, heavier than before. I forced myself to move, to turn and head back down the trail, but every step was an effort. My senses were on high alert, every crack of a twig or rustle of leaves sending my heart racing. It wasn't until I was back on the main trail, the familiar sights and sounds of the forest returning to normal, that I allowed myself to breathe again. I radioed the station, reporting the elk's carcass and the strange sounds I'd heard. My supervisor Dan told me to head back to the station and that they'd send a team out to investigate. I did as I was told, but the unease stayed with me. Even after I returned to the station, even after I'd clocked out and driven back to my cabin on the outskirts of town, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was very, very wrong. I spent the evening trying to distract myself, watching TV, reading, anything to take my mind off what I'd seen. But it was no use. The image of the elk, its twisted head and mutilated body, kept flashing in my mind. And that growl? I'd never heard anything like it in all my years as a ranger. Sleep didn't come easy that night. When I finally did drift off, it was into a restless, fitful sleep, filled with nightmares of dark shapes moving through the trees and glowing eyes watching me from the shadows. The next morning, I woke to find a voicemail from Dan. The team had gone out to the clearing I'd reported, but they hadn't found the elk. There was no sign of the carcass, no blood, nothing. It was as if it had never been there. Dan asked if I was sure about what I'd seen, suggesting maybe it had been a trick of the light or a hallucination brought on by exhaustion. But I knew what I'd seen. I wasn't losing my mind. Still, I couldn't help but feel a gnawing doubt creep into my thoughts. 
Had I imagined it? The growl, the smell, the sight of the elk's lifeless eyes staring back at me. It seemed impossible, but I couldn't deny the fact that the evidence was gone. I spent the day in a daze, going through the motions of my usual routine but feeling like I was on autopilot. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something was lurking just out of sight, waiting for the right moment to strike. The following week passed uneventfully. I continued my patrols, avoiding the new trail as much as possible. The other rangers didn't mention the elk or the growl, and I didn't bring it up either. It was easier to pretend it hadn't happened, to convince myself that it had all been some bizarre dream. But then, the disappearances started. The first was a hiker, a young man in his early twenties who'd come to the forest to get away from the pressures of city life. He'd checked in at the trailhead, but never returned. When his family reported him missing, a search team was dispatched. They found his campsite, but there was no sign of him. His gear was intact, his tent undisturbed, but he was gone. Vanished without a trace. A week later, it was a pair of experienced climbers. They'd been scaling one of the more challenging cliffs in the area, something they'd done countless times before. But this time, they didn't make it back. Their ropes were found dangling from the cliff face, still securely fastened, but the climbers were nowhere to be found. It was as if they'd simply been plucked off the mountain by some unseen force. The disappearances sent a ripple of fear through the small community. People started whispering about the forest, about how something wasn't right. Some said it was a bear, others a cougar. But those who knew the woods, the old-timers who'd lived in the area their whole lives, spoke in hushed tones of something else. Something older, something darker that had always been there, lurking in the shadows. I tried to ignore the rumors, but they ate away at me. I couldn't stop thinking about the elk, about the growl I'd heard, about how the forest had felt that day. I knew there was something out there, something that was responsible for the disappearances, but I didn't know what it was, and that terrified me more than anything. One evening, after another fruitless search for the missing climbers, I found myself driving back to the trailhead where I'd first encountered the elk. I don't know what possessed me to go back, but something was pulling me there, a nagging need to find answers. The sun was setting as I parked my truck and started down the trail, the light fading quickly as I ventured deeper into the woods. The air was thick with the scent of pine and damp earth, the ground soft beneath my boots. The trail was eerily silent, the usual sounds of wildlife conspicuously absent. As I neared the clearing where I'd found the elk, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. The smell hit me before I saw it, that same rancid metallic stench that had filled my nostrils the first time. I slowed my pace, every instinct screaming at me to turn back, to leave this place and never return. But I kept going, driven by a morbid curiosity, a need to know what was out there. When I reached the clearing, I saw it. The elk was back, or at least what was left of it. The body was in the same place, slumped against the tree, but this time it was worse. The flesh was even more ragged, the bones exposed, gnawed clean in some places. But the head... The head had been twisted even further, the neck broken in a way that defied logic. I stumbled back, my heart racing as I fumbled for my flashlight. I swung the beam around the clearing, looking for any sign of movement, any clue as to what could have done this. But there was nothing. The forest was still, the only sound my own ragged breathing. And then I saw it. In the shadows at the edge of the clearing, a pair of eyes. Glowing, yellow eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness, staring right at me. They were too high off the ground to belong to any animal I knew, too intelligent to be anything natural. I felt a cold dread wash over me as I realized that whatever this was, it wasn't just an animal. It was something else, something ancient and malevolent. The eyes didn't move, just watched me with a predatory intensity that made my skin crawl. I didn't wait to see what would happen next. I turned and ran, 
tearing down the trail as fast as my legs would carry me. I could hear something behind me, crashing through the underbrush, but I didn't dare look back. I just kept running, my heart pounding in my ears, my breath coming in ragged gasps. By the time I reached my truck, I was shaking so badly I could barely get the key in the ignition. I floored it, speeding down the narrow dirt road until I was back in town, the lights of hump to lips a welcome sight in the darkness. I didn't tell anyone about what I'd seen, not even Dan. I knew they wouldn't believe me, that they'd think I was losing my mind. Maybe I was. But I knew one thing for sure. I wasn't going back to that trail. Not ever. The disappearances were never solved. The hikers, the climbers, they were just gone, swallowed up by the forest. The official reports blamed a rogue bear, maybe a cougar, but I knew better. There was something else out there, something that didn't belong in our world, something that was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next victim. And I knew that I was lucky to have made it out alive, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't over, that whatever was out there wasn't done with me yet. Every night as I lay in bed, I could feel those eyes watching me, waiting. I knew it was only a matter of time before it came for me. And when it did, I wasn't sure if I'd be so lucky the next time. The forest had always been my sanctuary. I'm not talking about some picturesque wilderness, untouched by human hands. No, I'm talking about the gritty, dense, and unforgiving wilderness of the Olympic National Forest in Washington. I've been hiking, climbing, and working these woods for over 20 years, both as a park ranger and as a dedicated outdoor enthusiast. I knew every ridge, every stream, and every hidden path. Or at least, I thought I did. My name's Trevor, and I've seen a lot in my time out here. Lost hikers, bear encounters, storms that seem like the sky itself is ripping open. But nothing, absolutely nothing, prepared me for the night I came face to face with something I could never fully understand. A night that still haunts me, as real as the earth beneath my boots, yet as elusive as a shadow slipping through the trees. This is my story. Not a tall tale or a piece of fiction meant to scare campfire crowds. This is what happened, and I'm sharing it because, well, maybe it's the only way I can make sense of it. Or maybe it's just a warning to anyone who dares to wander too far off the beaten path, thinking they know what's out there. It was early October, just before the tourist season died down completely, and the forest started reclaiming its solitude. The days were getting shorter, the nights colder. The leaves had begun to turn, painting the landscape in a collage of amber and crimson, but the air still held the dampness of the summer rains. I was on a solo hike up to a remote part of the forest where few ventured. The locals called it Ironclad Hollow, named after the iron-rich cliffs that loomed over the narrow valley below. The name didn't do justice to the eeriness of the place. It wasn't just the remoteness. There was something else. A stillness that pressed in on you, like the forest was holding its breath. I'd been there before, years ago, and something about the place had drawn me back. Maybe it was the challenge, maybe it was the solitude, or maybe it was just plain curiosity. But this time, I wasn't on a leisure hike. I was checking on some equipment left by a research team studying the area's unique geology. They had left a week earlier, their project cut short by some unexplained equipment failures. My job was to retrieve their gear before the winter snows made the area inaccessible. I set off early in the morning, hoping to make it to the site by noon, check the gear, and head back before nightfall. But things rarely go as planned in the wilderness. The trail was rougher than I remembered, overgrown with brambles and strewn with fallen branches. By the time I reached Ironclad Hollow, the sun was already dipping low in the sky, casting long shadows that seemed to stretch forever. The first thing I noticed was the silence. The usual chorus of birds, insects, and rustling leaves was absent, replaced by a heavy, oppressive quiet. Even the wind seemed to avoid this place, 
as if it too was wary of disturbing whatever slept within the hollow. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, but I shrugged it off. After all, I'd been in eerie places before. Fear was just part of the job. I found the research team's camp easily enough. Their tents were still pitched, though sagging and damp from the recent rains. The equipment, cameras, seismographs, and other gadgets, was strewn about, some of it smashed beyond recognition. That's when I noticed something odd. The metal casing on the seismograph was bent, not just dented but twisted, as if something with incredible strength had tried to tear it apart. I crouched down to inspect the damage, and that's when I saw them. Tracks. They weren't like any animal tracks I'd seen before. Too large for a bear, too wide for a cougar, and definitely not human. The prints were deep, pressed into the mud like whatever made them had weighed a ton. I followed the tracks with my eyes as they disappeared into the undergrowth. A rational part of my mind told me to turn back, report what I'd seen, and let someone else figure it out. But another part of me, the part that had always pushed me to explore the unknown, wouldn't let it go. I grabbed my flashlight and decided to follow the tracks. I had to know what had been here. The light was fading fast as I made my way through the thick underbrush, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the encroaching darkness. The tracks led me deeper into the hollow, through a narrow passage between the cliffs where the trees grew taller and the shadows darker. The air was cooler here, almost cold, and carried a faint metallic scent that reminded me of blood. I don't know how long I walked, but at some point, I realized I wasn't alone. The forest around me, once quiet, now seemed alive with movement. I caught glimpses of something in the corner of my eye, dark shapes moving just out of sight, the crunch of leaves underfoot where there should have been none. My heart pounded in my chest, my instincts screaming at me to run, but my legs refused to obey. Then I saw it, standing in the middle of the path ahead, partially obscured by the trees. At first, I thought it was a man, tall and broad-shouldered, but as I moved closer, I realized I was wrong. It wasn't a man. It was something else. Something that shouldn't exist. The creature stood on two legs, covered in thick, matted fur that seemed to absorb the light from my flashlight. Its eyes reflected the beam, glowing with an unnatural, almost malevolent intelligence. It had the head of a wolf, but larger, with a snout full of sharp, yellowed teeth that glistened as it breathed heavily, its breath misting in the cold air. I froze, unable to move, unable to think. The creature just stared at me, and for a moment, we were both still, locked in some primal standoff. Then, with a low rumble that I felt more than heard, it stepped forward, its claws digging into the earth with each step. This wasn't happening. It couldn't be happening. I had seen wolves before, but this thing was different. Larger, more powerful, and with a presence that seemed to fill the entire forest. My mind raced, trying to make sense of what I was seeing, but the logical part of my brain had shut down, leaving only raw fear. I don't know what possessed me, but instead of running, I spoke. My voice was barely a whisper, shaky and weak, but it was all I could manage. What do you want? The creature paused, tilting its head as if considering the question. Then, in a flash of movement that was too fast for something of its size, it lunged at me. I barely had time to react, throwing myself to the ground as it swiped at where my head had been just seconds before. I rolled onto my back, my hands scrabbling for something, anything to defend myself. My flashlight had rolled away, casting wild, erratic beams of light across the trees. The creature loomed over me, its breath hot and foul as it snarled. This was it. I was going to die here, torn apart by something that shouldn't exist, in a place where no one would ever find me. But then, something strange happened. The creature hesitated, its snarl faltering as it stared down at me. Its eyes, those glowing, malevolent eyes, softened for just a moment, as if it was considering something. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, it turned and fled, disappearing into the darkness without a sound. I lay there for what felt like an eternity, 
too stunned to move, too terrified to even breathe. When I finally regained control of my body, I scrambled to my feet, grabbed my flashlight, and ran. I didn't look back. I didn't need to. The only thing that mattered was getting as far away from that place as possible. I stumbled back to the research camp, barely aware of my surroundings, my mind still reeling from what I had just witnessed. The sky had fully darkened by then, the moon casting an eerie glow over the landscape. I didn't stop until I reached the edge of the hollow, where the trees thinned out and the trail became more familiar. By the time I made it back to civilization, it was well past midnight. I was covered in mud, scratches and bruises, my clothes torn, and my mind on the edge of collapse. But I was alive. I reported what I had found to my superiors, but I left out the part about the creature. What could I say? That I had been attacked by a werewolf? They would have laughed me out of the room, or worse, they would have sent me for a psychological evaluation. Instead, I told them about the damage to the equipment and the strange tracks, suggesting that a bear might have wandered into the area. They bought it, mostly because they had no reason not to. The research team's equipment was retrieved the next day by a larger team, and Ironclad Hollow was declared off-limits for future expeditions. The official explanation was unstable terrain and hazardous conditions, but I knew better. I knew what was really out there. It's been years since that night, but the memory of it hasn't faded. I still work in the forest, though I avoid that part of it now. I've tried to rationalize what I saw, to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me, that the stress of the job had finally gotten to me. But deep down, I know the truth. There are things in this world that we can't explain. Things that live in the spaces between our reality and the legends we tell ourselves. I encountered one of those things, and I survived. But others haven't been so lucky. In the years since, there have been stories. Hikers gone missing, strange sightings in the woods, unexplained deaths. The locals talk about it in hushed tones, blaming it on bears, cougars, or the forest itself. But I know better. I know what's really out there. You never really expect the woods to betray you. That's the thing about forests. They're supposed to be places of peace, where the rustling leaves and chirping birds drown out the noise of the world. I've spent my whole life in the forest, whether for work or just to escape the chaos of everyday life. It's my sanctuary, my second home. But after what happened in the late summer of 1987, I've never looked at those trees the same way again. I was working as a ranger in a remote stretch of the Appalachian Mountains. The job was simple enough. Keep an eye on the trails, ensure hikers didn't get lost, and occasionally check in on the wildlife. It wasn't glamorous, but I loved it. There was something about being surrounded by nothing but nature that made everything feel... right. That summer, we had a small crew. Just me and two others, Dan and Lisa. We were all pretty close, having worked together for a couple of years. Dan was the quiet type, always with his nose in a book when he wasn't on patrol. Lisa, on the other hand, was the chatterbox of the group, always full of energy and jokes. I guess we balanced each other out. The first signs of trouble started in mid-August. It was a hot, sticky day, the kind where the air feels like it's clinging to your skin. I was making my rounds near the northern edge of our territory when I noticed something odd. The usual sounds of the forest, birds, insects, the distant trickle of a stream, had gone silent. It was eerie, but not entirely unusual. Sometimes the forest just goes quiet, like it's holding its breath. But this was different. The silence felt heavy, like something was watching me. I shook it off and continued my patrol, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. As I walked, I found myself glancing over my shoulder more than usual, but there was nothing there, just trees and shadows. The next day, Dan mentioned that he'd found something strange near the old logging road. 
deep scratches on the trunks of several trees. He thought it might have been a bear, but the claw marks were unusually large and spaced in a way that didn't make sense for any animal we knew in the area. Lisa joked that maybe it was Bigfoot, but Dan wasn't laughing. A couple of days later, the first hiker went missing. Her name was Emily Hayes, a college student from Ohio. She'd been hiking alone, which wasn't uncommon, though we always advised against it. When she didn't check in with her family as planned, they contacted us. We searched for three days, scouring every inch of the trails in the surrounding woods. We found her backpack, torn open, with some of her belongings scattered around. But there was no sign of Emily. It was like she'd just vanished. After that, the atmosphere among the crew changed. We were all on edge, more alert than usual. Dan started carrying his rifle with him on patrol, something he'd never done before. Lisa, usually so full of life, became quieter, more serious. We didn't talk about it much, but I could see the fear in their eyes, the same fear that was gnawing at my gut. Then came the night we heard the howling. It was late, probably around midnight. I was sitting by the fire outside the cabin, trying to unwind after a long day of searching for Emily. The sound was distant at first, barely noticeable over the crackling flames. But it grew louder, closer. It wasn't the kind of howl you'd expect from a wolf or a coyote. It was deeper, more guttural, and it sent a chill through my bones. Dan and Lisa heard it too. They came out of the cabin, both of them pale and wide-eyed. We stood there in silence, listening as the howling echoed through the trees. It lasted for what felt like hours, but was probably only a few minutes. Then, just as suddenly as it started, it stopped. What the hell was that? Lisa whispered, her voice trembling. Dan just shook his head. I don't know, but it's not a bear, and it's not any animal I've ever heard before. We decided to stay close to the cabin that night, all three of us keeping watch in shifts. But nothing else happened, and by morning it was almost like it had been a bad dream. But then, more hikers started to go missing. Two in one week, both of them experienced outdoorsmen who knew the area well. Just like Emily, they left no trace. No footprints, no signs of a struggle. Nothing. It was like the forest had swallowed them whole. We reported the disappearances to the authorities, but they didn't take it as seriously as they should have. The mountains were rugged, and people got lost all the time. They sent a few search parties, but when they turned up nothing... The cases were quietly shelved. Missing persons in the wilderness weren't exactly headline news, but we knew something was out there, something that was picking people off one by one. We just didn't know what. I started patrolling farther and farther out, determined to find some kind of answer. It was on one of those solo patrols that I found it, or rather, it found me. It was late afternoon, the sun just beginning to dip below the treetops, I was near the southern edge of our territory, close to where the land starts to rise into steep, rocky cliffs. The air was cooler there, and the shadows longer. I was walking along a narrow trail when I heard a twig snap behind me. I froze, my hand instinctively going to the knife on my belt. Slowly, I turned around, scanning the trees for any sign of movement. At first I saw nothing. But then, out of the corner of my eye... I caught a glimpse of something moving between the trees, something tall and dark. I've never believed in monsters, not really. But what I saw that day made me question everything I thought I knew. It was humanoid in shape, but far too large, at least seven feet tall, maybe more. Its skin was dark, almost black, and it seemed to shimmer in the fading light. But what struck me most were its eyes, yellow, glowing eyes that seemed to pierce right through me. I didn't wait to see more. I ran. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was terrified. I'd never felt fear like that before. The kind that grabs hold of you and doesn't let go. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the underbrush, moving faster than any human could. I didn't dare look back. I just ran, my heart pounding in my chest my breath coming in ragged gasps. 
Somehow I made it back to the cabin. Dan and Lisa were inside, and the look on my face must have told them everything they needed to know. We need to leave, I gasped, slamming the door shut behind me. Now! But it was too late. The howling started again, closer this time, just outside the cabin. The walls shook with the force of it, the windows rattling in their frames. I grabbed my rifle, my hands shaking as I loaded it. Dan and Lisa did the same, and we stood there, weapons ready, as the howling grew louder and louder. Then, silence. We waited, every nerve on edge, straining to hear any sound. The silence dragged on, oppressive and suffocating. Then came the scratching, slow, deliberate, as if something was toying with us. The sound of claws on wood, coming from the door. None of us moved. None of us dared to breathe. The scratching stopped, replaced by a low, rumbling growl, so deep it vibrated in my chest. My heart was pounding so hard I thought it might burst. I raised my rifle, aiming it at the door, my finger hovering over the trigger. And then, just as suddenly as it began, it stopped. We stood there for what felt like hours, waiting for the attack that never came. Finally, when the first light of dawn began to filter through the windows, we dared to move. The door was scratched and gouged, the wood splintered where those claws had raked across it, but whatever had been outside was gone. We didn't wait to find out if it would come back. We packed what little we could carry and left the cabin, not stopping until we reached the nearest town. We reported everything to the authorities, but they dismissed it as hysteria brought on by stress and exhaustion. They didn't believe us. I quit my job that day. I couldn't stay in those woods anymore, not after what I'd seen. Dan and Lisa did the same. We went our separate ways, each of us trying to forget, trying to move on. But I know that none of us ever really did. I've thought about that summer every day since it happened, trying to make sense of it, trying to convince myself that it was just my imagination. But deep down, I know the truth. Something is out there in those woods, something that isn't supposed to exist. And it's still out there, waiting, waiting for its next victim. I've always been a man of the woods. It's where I've felt most at home, away from the bustle of city life, away from the distractions of modern society. I made my living as a ranger, overseeing a stretch of wilderness in the northern part of Montana. This wasn't your typical national park, teeming with tourists and weekend hikers. It was an isolated expanse of dense forest and jagged mountains, known only to a handful of dedicated outdoorsmen and the odd local who knew better than to stray too far from the beaten path. The year was 1997, and I had been working in the forest for over a decade. I knew every trail, every creek, every hidden cave. Or at least I thought I did. My cabin was modest, just a one-room structure with a small porch that looked out over a narrow valley. The nearest town, Whispering Pines, was about a 30-minute drive down a dirt road that barely qualified as passable. It was a town that lived up to its name. Quiet, almost eerily so, as if the place itself held secrets that nobody wanted to talk about. I had heard the stories, of course. Every small town has them, the tales that locals share in hushed tones over a drink or two. They spoke of disappearances, people going missing in the woods, never to be found. Most folks chalked it up to the dangers of the wilderness, bears, mountain lions, or simple human error. Get lost out here, and the forest will swallow you whole. But there were always whispers of something more, something darker that lived deep within the trees. I never paid much mind to those stories, until I had to. It was late October when things started to get strange. The weather had taken a turn, and the forest was quieter than usual. The animals seemed to be retreating early for the winter, and the trees, usually vibrant with fall colors, looked almost sickly, their leaves a dull, muted brown instead of the fiery reds and oranges I was used to. The air felt different, too. Thicker. Heavier. 
like the woods were holding their breath. That's when the first hiker went missing. Her name was Annie Walker, a young woman in her mid-twenties. She was a regular out here, always up for a challenge. She'd even talked to me a few times about the best trails and places to camp. She knew the forest as well as anyone could, but one day, she just didn't come back. When Annie didn't return to Whispering Pines, the sheriff organized a search party. I was, of course, the first one they called. We scoured the woods for days, retracing her steps, checking every possible place she could have gone. But there was nothing. No tracks, no gear left behind, not even a broken branch. It was as if the forest had simply erased her. Then another one disappeared. A guy named Dave Parker, a local who worked as a guide. He was experienced, tough, not the kind of man who would get lost easily. But just like Annie, he vanished without a trace. Now, two people missing in such a short span of time wasn't unheard of in these parts, but it was enough to make the locals nervous. Whispers started to circulate again, stories of the beast of Whispering Pines, an old legend about a creature that supposedly lived deep in the forest, a creature that fed on those who wandered too far from the safety of the trails. I still didn't believe in such things. My mind was grounded in the practical, the tangible. But something was wrong in those woods, something I couldn't quite explain. One night, about a week after Dave's disappearance, I was sitting on my porch, nursing a cup of coffee, trying to make sense of it all. The forest was unnaturally quiet, not even the usual rustle of leaves or distant call of an owl. It was then that I saw it, just for a second, out of the corner of my eye, a shadow moving between the trees. It was large, much larger than any animal I'd seen out here, and it moved with a strange, fluid grace. I set down my coffee and grabbed my rifle. I wasn't a man prone to panic, but something about that shadow set my nerves on edge. I stepped off the porch, the wooden boards creaking under my weight, and headed toward the trees, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. Who's there? I called out, my voice sounding too loud in the stillness. There was no answer, just the faint sound of something moving in the underbrush. I followed it, my heart pounding in my chest. The beam of my flashlight caught something, just a glimpse of fur dark and matted. Then it was gone, disappearing deeper into the woods. I stood there, rifle in hand, trying to steady my breathing. I could feel eyes on me, watching from the darkness, but when I turned the light in that direction, there was nothing there. I must have stood there for a good ten minutes, listening, waiting, before I finally convinced myself to head back to the cabin. That night, sleep didn't come easily. I lay awake, the image of that shadow playing over and over in my mind. I knew what I had seen, but I didn't want to believe it. It didn't make any sense. And yet, deep down, I knew that whatever was out there was no ordinary animal. The next morning, I decided to head into town, talk to the sheriff, see if anyone else had reported anything unusual. The drive down to Whispering Pines was uneventful, the dirt road winding through the trees like a snake. When I got to the sheriff's office, I found him sitting at his desk, a half-empty cup of coffee in front of him. Morning, John, he said, looking up from his paperwork. What brings you in? I told him about the shadow, about what I'd seen. He listened, his expression serious, but I could tell he was skeptical. Look, I don't know what you saw out there, he said when I was finished, but it's probably just a bear. They're more active this time of year, getting ready for hibernation. Could have been a black bear, maybe even a grizzly. It wasn't a bear, I said firmly. It was something else. The sheriff sighed, leaning back in his chair. John, I've known you for a long time. You're not the type to get spooked easily, so I'm not going to dismiss this outright. But you've been out in those woods a lot lately. More than usual, what with the disappearances and all. Maybe your mind's playing tricks on you. I didn't argue. I knew what I'd seen, but I also knew there was no point in trying to convince him otherwise. We talked for a while longer about the missing hikers, but there was nothing new to report. 
It was as if they had just vanished off the face of the earth. As I was getting ready to leave, the sheriff stopped me. Just be careful out there, John. Whatever's going on, I don't want you ending up like the others. I will, I promised, though I wasn't sure what good being careful would do. The drive back to the cabin was quiet, my mind racing with thoughts of what I'd seen. I needed to know more. I needed to find out what was out there. But as the day wore on, I began to question myself. Maybe the sheriff was right. Maybe it was just a bear, and my mind had blown it out of proportion. That night, I decided to head back into the woods, to the spot where I'd seen the shadow. I needed to see it again, to prove to myself that I wasn't losing it. I grabbed my rifle, a flashlight, and a small pack with some supplies, just in case. The forest was even quieter than the night before, the trees standing like silent sentinels under the pale light of the moon. I made my way to the spot, my footsteps crunching softly on the dead leaves. As I approached the area, I slowed, listening for any sign of movement. At first there was nothing, just the stillness of the night. But then I heard it, a low, guttural sound, almost like a growl coming from somewhere ahead of me. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. The sound came again, closer this time, and I realized it wasn't coming from an animal. It was coming from a person. I moved cautiously forward, my flashlight sweeping the area in front of me. The beam of light caught something, a figure, hunched over, its back to me. It was covered in fur, thick and matted, and it was moving slowly, almost deliberately. Hey! I called out, raising my rifle. Who are you? What are you doing out here? The figure didn't respond. It just kept moving, its movements unnatural, almost like it was struggling to stay upright. I took a step closer, my finger on the trigger, ready to shoot if it came at me. That's when it turned around. I don't know how to describe what I saw. It was like looking at something that shouldn't exist, something that defied all logic and reason. The figure was humanoid, but its face was twisted, elongated, its eyes glowing a deep, unnatural yellow. Its mouth was filled with teeth, sharp and too many for a human. And those eyes, they were filled with a rage, a hunger that I could feel in my bones. I fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the trees, but the thing didn't go down. It didn't even flinch. It just stared at me, those yellow eyes boring into mine, and then it let out a sound, a howl that sent chills down my spine. It was a sound that no human should be able to make, a sound filled with pain, anger, and something else, something darker. I didn't wait to see what it would do next. I turned and ran, the trees blurring past me as I sprinted back toward the cabin. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the underbrush, gaining on me. My mind was screaming at me to move faster, but my legs felt like they were made of lead. When I finally burst through the tree line and into the clearing where my cabin stood, I dared to look back. The thing was gone, vanished into the darkness, but I knew it wasn't far. It was out there, watching, waiting. I slammed the door shut and locked it, my hands trembling. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what had just happened, but there was no making sense of it. What I had seen was impossible, and yet it was real, more real than anything I had ever experienced. I didn't sleep that night. I sat in the dark, my rifle across my lap, waiting for the dawn. Every sound, every creak of the cabin made me jump. I knew that whatever was out there wasn't going to just disappear. It was going to keep coming, and I didn't know if I could stop it. The next morning, I packed my things. I wasn't going to stay out here, not anymore. The forest that I had once loved had turned against me, become something dangerous, something I couldn't fight. I drove into town, my hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly that my knuckles turned white. When I got to the sheriff's office, I told him everything, every last detail. He listened, his expression unreadable. When I was done, he nodded slowly. I believe you, he said, his voice low. 
You're not the first person to see it. I stared at him, shocked. What do you mean? There have been stories, going back decades, he explained. People seeing things in the woods, things that don't make sense. Most of them don't live to talk about it. You're one of the lucky ones. Lucky? I echoed, my voice shaking. What the hell was that thing? The sheriff shook his head. I don't know. Nobody does. But whatever it is, it's been out there a long time. And it's not going away. I left Whispering Pines that day, and I never went back. I couldn't. The memories of what happened in those woods haunted me. The image of that creature burned into my mind. I tried to move on, to forget. But some things you just can't leave behind. I've heard that more people have gone missing since then. More hikers, more locals. The stories continue. The legend of the beast of Whispering Pines growing with each new disappearance. Some say it's just a myth, a tale to scare children. But I know the truth. I've seen it. And I know that whatever it is, it's still out there, waiting in the shadows of the forest, waiting for its next victim. And I know one thing for sure. It won't be me. I never believed in the supernatural. My life was rooted in the tangible, trees, soil, and the harsh realities of the wilderness. Working as a forest ranger in the dense, sprawling expanse of Whispering Pines National Park in northern Minnesota was supposed to be a dream come true. The park, named for the way the wind seemed to whisper through the towering pines, had always been a place of solace for me. But that all changed in the summer of 1989, when the lines between reality and legend began to blur in ways I could never have imagined. I remember the day it started as clearly as if it were yesterday. It was late July, and the weather had been unseasonably warm, even for that time of year. The thick canopy of the forest usually kept things cool, but the heat wave had turned the woods into a stifling sauna. The wildlife was more restless than usual, and I had spent the better part of the afternoon checking in on campers who were struggling to keep cool. My radio crackled to life just as I was finishing up my rounds near Pine Hollow, a remote part of the park known for its rugged terrain and few visitors. The voice on the other end belonged to Pete, a seasoned ranger with more years in the park than anyone else on the team. Jake, you there? Pete's voice was laced with a tension that caught my attention immediately. Yeah. I'm here. What's up? I replied, adjusting the volume on my handheld radio. Got a report of a hiker missing up near Black Bear Ridge. She was supposed to check in with her group last night, but never showed. They've been searching for her since dawn, but no luck. Can you head over and give them a hand? On my way, I said, already turning the wheel of my old jeep toward the dirt road that led to Black Bear Ridge. The ridge was one of the highest points in the park, offering sweeping views of the forest below. It was also one of the most treacherous areas to hike, with steep drops, narrow paths, and thick underbrush that could easily throw someone off course. As I drove, I couldn't shake a feeling of unease that settled in the pit of my stomach. People went missing in the park from time to time, but something about this call felt different. When I arrived at the trailhead, the search party was already in full swing. Park rangers volunteers, and even a few local law enforcement officers were combing the area, calling out the missing hiker's name. Sarah, I learned. She was a college student from Duluth, up here with a group of friends for the summer. According to her friends, she had gone off on her own the previous afternoon, saying she wanted to take some pictures of the sunset from the ridge. She never returned. I joined the search, working my way through the dense underbrush and calling out Sarah's name until my voice was hoarse. But as the hours passed, the hope of finding her dwindled. The sun dipped low in the sky, casting long shadows that seemed to stretch and twist in ways that played tricks on my eyes. The whispers of the wind through the pines felt more insistent, more urgent, as if the forest itself was trying to tell me something. It wasn't until the following morning that we found her or what was left of her. I was the one who stumbled upon the scene, 
not far from the ridge's edge. The underbrush had been trampled, and the ground was stained with dark, dried blood. Her body was mutilated, torn apart in a way that I had never seen before. The horror of it made my stomach churn, and I had to step away, fighting the urge to vomit. The others arrived quickly after I called it in, and the area was soon swarming with investigators. The initial assumption was that Sarah had been attacked by a bear or some other wild animal, but something about the scene didn't sit right with me. I'd seen bear attacks before. They were brutal. But this... this was something else entirely. The wounds were too precise, too deliberate. And then there were the tracks. Deep, clawed prints in the dirt that didn't match anything I had ever seen in the forest. They were too large for a wolf, too distinct from a bear's, and the stride was all wrong, as if whatever had made them had been moving on two legs instead of four. The official report filed by the park and local authorities listed Sarah's death as the result of an animal attack, likely a bear. But in the days that followed, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were missing something, that there was more to this story than anyone was willing to admit. Over the next few weeks, I threw myself into my work, trying to distract myself from the gnawing sense of dread that had taken root inside me. But it wasn't long before the whispers began to spread among the rangers, the volunteers, and even some of the locals. There were stories, old legends, about creatures that roamed the forests at night, beasts that were neither man nor animal, but something in between. At first, I dismissed the tales as nothing more than campfire stories, the kind of folklore that sprang up in isolated places like Whispering Pines. But the more I heard, the harder it became to ignore the uneasy feeling that something was very, very wrong in the park. The turning point came one evening in late August. The heat wave had finally broken, and a cool breeze was sweeping through the forest, carrying with it the scent of pine and damp earth. I was making my rounds near Pine Hollow again when I noticed something odd, a low, rhythmic sound, almost like a chant, coming from deeper in the woods. I followed the sound, my flashlight cutting through the gathering dusk as I made my way through the trees. The noise grew louder as I approached, and soon I could make out voices, deep, guttural and not entirely human. My heart pounded in my chest as I crept closer, keeping to the shadows as best I could. When I finally reached the source of the noise, I found myself at the edge of a small clearing, hidden behind a thick stand of trees. In the center of the clearing stood a group of people, their faces obscured by the hoods of their dark robes. They were gathered around something, a large, twisted shape that lay on the ground between them. It took me a moment to realize what I was looking at, the shape on the ground was the body of a deer, its throat slashed open and its blood pooling beneath it. The figures in the clearing were chanting, their voices low and hypnotic as they performed some sort of ritual around the animal's corpse. I watched in stunned silence, too shocked to move, as the ritual continued. The air seemed to thrum with energy, a dark and malevolent force that pressed down on me, making it hard to breathe. And then... As if sensing my presence, one of the figures turned and looked directly at me. I don't know how, but in that instant, I knew that whatever, or whoever they were, they weren't entirely human. The eyes that met mine were a sickly yellow, glowing faintly in the dim light. A cold, predatory intelligence radiated from those eyes, and I felt a chill crawl down my spine. I bolted from the clearing my heart hammering in my chest as I crashed through the underbrush, not caring about the noise I was making. I didn't stop until I reached the safety of my jeep, my hands shaking as I fumbled with the keys. As I drove away, I could still feel those eyes watching me, burning into the back of my skull. I didn't tell anyone what I had seen that night. Who would believe me? A group of people performing some kind of dark ritual in the middle of the forest, led by a creature that wasn't quite human? It sounded insane, and I wasn't even sure if I believed it myself. But the events that followed made it impossible to ignore the truth. In the weeks after that night, the strange occurrences in the park intensified. More hikers went missing, their bodies never found. 
Campers reported hearing eerie howls at night, sounds that didn't match any known animal in the area. And then there were the sightings, fleeting glimpses of a large shadowy figure moving through the trees, always just out of sight. The tension among the rangers grew, though none of us spoke openly about it. There was an unspoken agreement to keep things quiet, to avoid causing a panic among the visitors. But we all knew something was out there, something dangerous and beyond our understanding. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon and the forest was cast in shadow, I received a call from Pete. His voice was strained, the usual gruffness replaced by something close to fear. Jake, I need you to meet me at the old fire lookout tower near Black Bear Ridge, he said. It's important. The tower had been abandoned for years, a relic from when the Park Service had used it to spot wildfires. It was miles from the nearest trail, deep in the heart of the forest. I didn't ask why Pete wanted to meet there. I just grabbed my gear and headed out. The hike to the tower was long and arduous, the trail overgrown and difficult to navigate. By the time I reached the clearing where the tower stood, the sky had turned a deep indigo, the first stars beginning to peek through the darkness. Pete was waiting for me at the base of the tower, his expression grim. He didn't waste any time on pleasantries. I found something, he said, his voice low. Up at the top. I think you need to see it. We climbed the rickety stairs to the top of the tower in silence, the wood creaking under our weight. When we reached the observation deck, Pete pointed to the far corner, where something was scrawled on the floor in what looked like charcoal. I leaned down to get a closer look and felt my blood run cold. The symbols etched into the wood were like nothing I had ever seen before. Intricate, angular shapes that seemed to twist and writhe as I stared at them. They were accompanied by a word written in jagged, almost frantic strokes. Loop Garou. It's French, Pete said quietly. It means werewolf. I looked up at him, trying to process what I was seeing. You think that's what's been causing all this? A werewolf? Pete shook his head, a haunted look in his eyes. I don't know what to think anymore, Jake. But whatever it is, it's not just some wild animal. There's something out here, something ancient and evil, and it's getting stronger. We stayed up in the tower for hours, talking in hushed tones as we tried to piece together what was happening in Whispering Pines. Pete told me about the old legends, stories passed down by the Native American tribes who had lived in the area long before the park was established. They spoke of a creature that roamed the woods, a shapeshifter that could take the form of a wolf or a man, feeding on the fear and flesh of those who crossed its path. I wanted to dismiss it all as nonsense, as the ramblings of old men who had spent too much time alone in the woods. But after everything I had seen, I couldn't. The evidence was all around us, in the missing hikers, the strange tracks, the mutilated animals, and now, these symbols, a warning, perhaps, or a message. As dawn approached, we descended the tower and made our way back to the ranger station. We agreed to keep what we had found to ourselves for the time being, at least until we could figure out what to do next. But we never got the chance. The next day, Pete disappeared. I was the last person to see him. We had finished our morning patrol and were heading back to the station when Pete said he wanted to check out something near Pine Hollow, where the first attack had occurred. I offered to go with him, but he waved me off, saying it was probably nothing and that he'd meet me back at the station in an hour. He never returned. A massive search was launched, but no trace of Pete was ever found. No tracks, no signs of a struggle. Nothing. It was as if he had simply vanished into thin air. The official report listed him as missing, presumed dead, another victim of the dangers of the wilderness. But I knew better. Whatever had taken Pete was the same thing that had killed Sarah and all the others. The same thing that had watched me from the clearing, that had etched those symbols into the floor of the lookout tower. And now, it was hunting me. I quit my job as a ranger soon after that, I couldn't stay in Whispering Pines, not with the memories of what had happened there. I moved to a small town far from the forest, trying to start over, 
to forget. But the nightmares followed me. The whispers in the wind that seemed to call my name. The fleeting glimpses of yellow eyes in the darkness. I've spent years researching, trying to understand what happened in those woods. What I encountered. I've read every book on folklore, every account of werewolves and shapeshifters I could find. But the answers are elusive, slipping through my fingers like smoke. All I know for certain is that something is out there. Something ancient and malevolent, something that defies explanation. And though I've put miles and years between myself and Whispering Pines, I can still feel its presence, lurking in the shadows, waiting. I tell my story now not to seek understanding or closure, but as a warning. There are places in this world where the boundaries between reality and legend are thin, where the old gods and monsters of our nightmares still roam, waiting for the unwary to stumble into their path. And if you ever find yourself in Whispering Pines, remember this. Stay on the trails, don't wander into the woods alone, and if you hear the wind whispering your name, don't answer. Some things are better left in the darkness. My name is Zachary Drake, but most people call me Zach. I've lived in the mountains of Colorado all my life. I know these woods better than I know myself. Growing up, the forest was my playground, my refuge. My dad was a ranger, his dad before him. Being out in the wilderness was as natural to me as breathing. I work as a guide now, taking tourists and sometimes thrill-seekers out to experience the kind of beauty that only comes from being miles away from the nearest road, where the air is crisp and the only sounds are those of the wind and the wildlife. But the woods can also be unforgiving. They have a way of reminding you how small and insignificant you really are. This is a story about one such reminder, a lesson I won't soon forget. It was the summer of 1995, and I'd taken a group of city folks out for a three-day hike deep into the San Juan National Forest. There were four of them, two couples in their late thirties, early forties. The type that wear brand new gear straight out of the REI catalog, but don't know a damn thing about using it. I don't usually get too attached to the people I guide, but this group was different. They were friendly, down to earth. One of the guys, Jake, was a big shot lawyer from Denver. The other, Mark, was an engineer from Boulder. Their wives, Sarah and Linda, were sisters, both teachers. Good people, the kind you could sit around a campfire with and talk about more than just the weather. We set off early on a Friday morning. The sun was just starting to creep over the mountains, casting long shadows through the trees. The first day was uneventful, just the way I like it. We followed the trail up into the high country, past old-growth pines and fast-flowing streams, climbing higher and higher until we reached a plateau where we set up camp for the night. The air was thin up there, and the only sounds were the rustling of the trees and the occasional call of a distant bird. We built a fire, cooked dinner, and spent the evening trading stories and laughing. By the time the fire had burned down to embers, everyone was ready to turn in. I took the first watch, not because I was worried about anything, just habit. Out in the wilderness, it's best to keep an eye on things, even if the only threat is a curious raccoon or a bear sniffing around for leftovers. The night was calm, the stars bright enough to see by. The others slept soundly in their tents, oblivious to the world around them. It wasn't until well past midnight that I noticed something was off. At first it was just a feeling a sense that something wasn't right. I couldn't put my finger on it, but the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I scanned the tree line, looking for movement, but saw nothing. The woods were eerily quiet, as if the night itself was holding its breath. I stood up, gripping my flashlight, and slowly turned in a circle, my eyes straining to see into the darkness beyond the reach of the campfire's dying light. Still nothing. I was just about to chalk it up to my imagination when I heard it. A faint rustling, like something moving through the underbrush. It was coming from the north, where the forest was thickest. I aimed my flashlight in that direction, but
but the beam only penetrated a few yards into the trees. Whatever was out there was staying just out of sight. I took a step toward the sound, then stopped myself. My job was to keep the group safe, not go off chasing shadows in the dark. I decided to wake Jake. He was the kind of guy who wouldn't mind keeping me company on watch. I turned to head toward his tent when I heard the rustling again. Closer this time. Much closer. I froze, my breath caught in my throat. The sound was coming from just beyond the tree line, maybe twenty feet away. My flashlight flicked across the trees, searching for the source. And then I saw them. Two glowing eyes staring back at me from the darkness. They were too high off the ground to be a bear or a mountain lion, too wide apart to be human. My mind raced, trying to make sense of what I was seeing, but before I could react, the eyes blinked and disappeared into the night. The rustling grew louder for a moment, then faded into silence. I stood there, heart pounding, trying to convince myself that I hadn't just imagined the whole thing, but deep down, I knew something was out there, something that didn't belong. I backed away slowly, never taking my eyes off the spot where I'd seen the eyes, until I reached Jake's tent. I crouched down, shook his shoulder and whispered his name. He stirred, mumbled something, and then opened his eyes. Zack, what's up? He asked groggily, sitting up and rubbing his eyes. Something's out there, I whispered, my voice barely audible. I don't know what, but it's close. Jake's expression changed from sleepy to serious in an instant. He reached for his boots, pulling them on quickly, then grabbed his flashlight and a large hunting knife he'd brought along for the trip. I could see the adrenaline kicking in, his mind shifting into survival mode. He was no stranger to danger, but this was different. This was the unknown. We stepped out of the tent together, moving quietly toward the tree line where I'd seen the eyes. Jake's flashlight cut through the darkness, illuminating the underbrush, but there was nothing there. No tracks, no signs of movement. It was as if whatever it was had vanished into thin air. We stood there for a long moment, listening, but the night had returned to its unnatural silence. You sure you saw something? Jake asked, his voice low but steady. Yeah, I replied, my eyes still scanning the darkness. I'm sure. It was... watching us. Jake nodded, his jaw set. He didn't doubt me, but there was nothing more we could do. We were miles from the nearest road, with no way to call for help if we needed it. We had no choice but to wait until morning, hope that whatever was out there wouldn't come back. We returned to the campfire, throwing a few more logs on to keep it burning bright. We sat in silence, our eyes on the trees, waiting for the first light of dawn. The next morning, the others woke up none the wiser. Jake and I exchanged a look, but we didn't say anything about what had happened. No need to spook them. Not yet, anyway. We packed up camp and continued on our hike, following the trail deeper into the mountains. The day passed without incident, but the memory of those glowing eyes stayed with me, a constant reminder that we weren't alone out here. By the time we made camp that night, we were at the base of a cliff, a sheer rock face rising up behind us like a wall. The forest was dense around us, the trees pressing in from all sides. It felt claustrophobic, like we were being watched. The others didn't seem to notice, but Jake and I were on edge. We didn't stray far from the fire that night, and when it was time to sleep, we kept our weapons close at hand. I took the first watch again, my eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. But the night passed uneventfully, and I began to think that maybe we'd imagined the whole thing. Maybe it was just a trick of the light, a pair of deer or some other animal that had wandered too close to camp. But deep down, I knew better. It was around 3 a.m. when I heard it, the same rustling sound from the night before. This time, it was coming from the opposite direction, from the cliff behind us. I turned slowly, my flashlight cutting through the darkness, but there was nothing there. The rustling grew louder, more insistent, like something was moving through the underbrush, coming closer and closer. And then, 
just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. I stood there, flashlight in hand, waiting. My heart was pounding in my chest, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. I didn't know what to expect, but I knew I had to be ready for anything. I took a step forward, my eyes fixed on the spot where the sound had come from. When I heard it, a low, rumbling growl, deep and guttural, echoing off the cliff behind me. I spun around, my flashlight swinging wildly, and there it was, standing at the edge of the firelight, its massive form silhouetted against the trees. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before, a nightmare made flesh. It stood on two legs, towering over me, its body covered in thick, matted fur. Its eyes glowed with an unnatural light, and its teeth, sharp and deadly, gleamed in the darkness. It was a creature straight out of folklore, a werewolf. I froze, my mind racing. This couldn't be real. Werewolves were just stories, myths told around campfires to scare kids. But there it was, standing in front of me, its breath hot and fetid in the cold night air. It took a step forward, its eyes locked on mine, and I knew I was out of my depth. I didn't stand a chance against something like this. The others were still asleep, oblivious to the danger we were in. I had to do something, had to protect them, but my body wouldn't move. I was paralyzed with fear, my mind screaming at me to run, to fight, to do anything but stand there like a deer caught in headlights. But I couldn't. All I could do was watch as the creature took another step forward, its eyes never leaving mine. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it stopped. It sniffed the air, its eyes narrowing, and then it turned and vanished into the trees, disappearing into the darkness as if it had never been there at all. The night was silent again, the only sound my own ragged breathing. I collapsed to the ground, my body shaking, my mind struggling to process what I had just seen. I didn't wake the others that night. I didn't tell them what had happened, what I had seen. I couldn't. They wouldn't believe me, and even if they did, what could we do? We were miles from anywhere, with no way to defend ourselves against something like that. So I kept it to myself, hoping against hope that it wouldn't come back. The next day, we packed up camp and started the long hike back to civilization. The others were in high spirits, talking and laughing, completely unaware of the danger we had been in. Jake kept glancing at me, his eyes full of questions. But I didn't have any answers for him. I was just glad we were getting out of those woods. It wasn't until we were almost back to the trailhead that we realized something was wrong. Sarah was the first to notice, her voice filled with panic as she called out to her sister. Linda was gone. We searched the area, calling her name, but there was no sign of her. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. The trail was well marked, and she had been right behind us just a few minutes ago. There was no way she could have gotten lost, not here. But she was gone, and we had no idea where she could be. Panic set in as we searched the surrounding woods, our calls echoing through the trees. But there was no response, no sign of Linda anywhere. It was as if she had been swallowed up by the forest. Jake and I exchanged a look, the same thought running through our minds, but neither of us dared to say it out loud. We both knew what had happened, but we couldn't bring ourselves to admit it. Not yet. We kept searching until the sun began to set, but it was no use. Linda was gone, and there was nothing we could do to bring her back. We had no choice but to hike out and report her missing, but deep down, I knew we would never see her again. The search for Linda lasted weeks. Park rangers, local law enforcement, even a few volunteers combed the area, but they found nothing. No tracks, no signs of struggle, no clues to what had happened to her. It was as if she had disappeared off the face of the earth. Jake and Sarah were devastated, but there was nothing they could do. No one believed the stories Jake and I told about the creature we'd seen. They chalked it up to stress, to exhaustion, 
to anything but the truth. As the weeks turned into months, the search was eventually called off. Linda was declared missing, presumed dead, and life went on. But for those of us who were there, life was never the same. I quit my job as a guide and moved out of Colorado, unable to face the woods that had once been my home. Jake and Sarah eventually divorced, the strain of Linda's disappearance too much for their marriage to bear. I've tried to move on, to forget what happened in those woods, but I can't. The image of that creature, those glowing eyes, haunts my dreams. I still see them sometimes, in the dark corners of my mind, a reminder that there are things in this world that we will never understand, things that lurk in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike. And I know, deep down, that it's still out there somewhere, watching, waiting, watching, 